All right, our next chapter is joint. So this is coming off of chapter six about skeletal tissues, chapter seven, specifically looking at the skeleton. Now we're gonna look at where bones articulate together and where bones articulate together, we form joints. So joints are also called articulations and joints are really the weakest part of the skeleton. The other name for joints, of course, is articulations. You're gonna hear that back and forth. Articulations are joints, joints are articulations. And articulations are where two or more bones meet. Now this definition, just saying articulations are where two or, more, two or more bones meet, that doesn't include movement. Just because two bones meet doesn't mean that they meet and immediately form a joint or they form a particular type of joint or they're necessarily gonna move a particular way. All you're saying when you say two bones articulate is that that's where they meet. You have to add more terminology in order to talk about their functions and the mobility and how different articulations are held together. So the functions of joints are going to be that movement and it's going to be how they're holding the skeleton together. So we can classify joints based on those two things, the structure, what's holding them together, and their function, how they move. So let's test ourselves. Joint A is held together by dense fibrous connective tissue. The description of the joint A describes its blank classification, and I'll give you a minute. So what this question is asking is the information given, which says how a joint is being held together, is that going to give us structural or functional classification information? If you said the answer was A, structural, you would be correct. Because remember, the structural classification of joints is the materials binding bones together and the presence or absence of a joint cavity. It's really what makes up the joint. Whereas its function is all about movement, it's based on the amount of movement in the joint. So functional classification of joints, all about movement, and you have three options, synarthroses, amphiarthroses, and diarthroses. Synarthroses is an immovable joint, an amphiarthroses is a slightly movable joint, and a diarthroses is a freely movable joint. For the structural classification, you also have three categories. The first two are gonna have no joint cavity. So that's gonna be fibrous and cartilaginous. The last synovial is going to be the one with the joint cavity. So let's look at fibrous first. So fibrous joints have no joint cavity. Their name tells you a little bit, and you may have already guessed that they're joined by fibrous tissue. Most fibrous joints are going to be functionally synarthrotic, meaning no movement. A good example of a synarthrotic fibrous joint is a gomphosis. That's your periodontal ligament. It's also known as a peg and socket fibrous joint, but essentially it's your tooth sitting in its socket. So an articulation of a tooth with its bony alveolar socket is a gomphosis, and that's immovable. You don't want it to move. There's three types of fibrous joints. You have sutures, which are between skull bones, syndesmoses, which are ligaments, and then you have the gomphoses, which we talked about, again, peg and socket. So let's talk about the sutures. Sutures should be immovable. So they're immovable joints between skull bones. So the skull bones themselves are actually comprised of interlocking junctions, so the skull bones fit pretty well together. And then in between those interlocking junctions are connective tissue fibers, fibrous connective tissue fibers. And that's gonna bind these bones together. It allows for a little bit of growth during youth. And that's why we have sutures, so there is growth allowed for the cranium. And then in middle age, once the cranium has stopped growing, the skull bones completely fuse, and they're no longer sutures. Instead, what's between the skull bones are synostoses, or bony junctions. So again, a suture is a fibrous joint, and that's talking about its structure. If we wanted to say anything about its function, we would have to mention that it's usually immovable or synarthrotic. Here's, the, here's another fibrous structural joint. This is a synosmosis. Thanks ligaments whenever you see synosmosis. So it's just a fibrous piece of tissue that attaches bone to bone. So a syndesmosis is essentially a ligament. And most of the time these ligaments are short, so they're not going to allow a lot of movement. They can be synarthrotic. Sometimes they might be slightly movable. So they might be amphiarthrotic. But the connection between the tibia and the fibula is a great example of a syndesmosis. There's also connections between the radius and ulna that are good examples of syndesmoses. Again, this is a structural joint. 
And if we want to talk about its function, we would say that it's synarthrotic to amphiarthrotic. It can be immovable, but it could be slightly movable. And here is that gomphosis that we talked about, the peg and socket joint, so essentially the tooth in its socket. And you can even see here pointed out on the right is the periodontal ligament. So that is the fibrous tissue that's going to hold a tooth in its socket. Alright, next let's move on to the cartilaginous joints. Still, no joint cavity. And you may have guessed from cartilaginous joint being the name that these two articulating bones that are a part of a cartilaginous joint are going to be united by cartilage. Now it could be hyaline cartilage or it could be fibrocartilage. So there's two types of cartilaginous joints. Those connected by hyaline cartilage are called synchondroses and those connected by fibrocartilage are symphyses. So if you have a bar or a plate of hyaline cartilage uniting bones, again we're going to call that a synchondroses. These are completely immovable and it makes sense if you learn where they're located. The epiphyseal plates so between the diaphysis and epiphyses of the long bones in children. They're also going to be located in costal cartilage, so between ribs and the sternum. So those locations are not going to really have movable structures, even though it's cartilage holding two bones together, therefore a joint, therefore an articulation, it's not movable. It's going to be synarthrotic. All synchondroses are synarthrotic. And let's, take, let's take apart that statement. So all synchondroses, which means all articulations or all joints where two bone ends meet and are held together by hyaline cartilage. Just saying all synchondroses means all that. So all joints that are held together by hyaline cartilage are synarthrotic. Synarthrotic is a functional classification and it means immovable. So let's look at our examples. These are our synachondroses. We have, again, that cartilage that allows for interstitial growth in bones called the epiphyseal plate. We know the epiphyseal plate will eventually ossify and become an epiphyseal line, but while it's an epiphyseal plate, it's a synchondrosis. It's a cartilaginous joint. And then, of course, we have the cartilage holding our true ribs to the sternum, and that's going to be a synchondrosis. So that's connecting bone to bone via cartilage, specifically hyaline cartilage, so it's a synchondrosis. Next, let's look at a symphysis. Now, symphyses tend to be amphiarthrotic. It'll make sense again when we look at their locations. You have symphyses between intervertebral discs. You have symphyses in between the coxal bones. So, intervertebral joints in the pubic symphysis are two locations of symphyses. One is even called a pubic symphysis, which is going to be the singular form of symphysis, and that's where it's getting its name, is based on the type of joint that it is. It's both amphiarthrotic, slightly movable, and connecting bones with fibrocartilage. So all symphyses use fibrocartilage to connect bone. All symphyses are slightly movable, so they're amphiarthrotic, we have strength, we have flexibility. That's why there's a little bit of movement allowed of the vertebral column. There's movement allowed of the pelvic bone to an extent. So just like synchondrosis meant hyaline cartilage, symphysis means fibrocartilage. And just like synchondroses are immovable or synarthrotic, symphyses are amphiarthrotic. Here are those examples again. Intervertebral disc, pubic symphysis, which is that anterior piece of fibrocartilage between the coxal bones. And then finally we get to synovial joints, which we're going to spend the most time on. Synovial joints are joints that have a joint cavity. So our other two types we've been looking at, fibrous and cartilaginous, did not have a joint cavity. Synovial joints do. So synovial joints are not only joints that articulate bones and hold them together, but they have this joint cavity which is really like a fluid containing sac that holds the bones together. And all synovial joints are freely movable. That means functionally they're diarthrotic. So diarthrosis meant a type of functional movement and that functional movement was freely movable, or the most movable type of a joint. So most joints you think about, like your knee joint, your shoulder joint, your hip joint, they are synovial joints, but they're also diarthrotic, freely movable. So let's look at the general structure for a synovial joint. This is a quick cheat sheet, so something to look over. 
you have articular cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage, on the ends of long bones. Then you have, of course, the joint cavity itself, which is paramount for a synovial joint. In the joint cavity, you have synovial fluids. So that's going to be another part of a synovial joint. Around the joint cavity, because the cavity is just a space, you have to have something that kind of covers the space. And that's going to be the double layer articular capsule, which has an inner synovial layer, which creates synovial fluid, and an outer fibrous layer for support. And then you also have reinforcing ligaments, nerves, and blood vessels. So let's look through those parts again. So articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage found on the ends of long bones. We know the function of hyaline from chapter four. It prevents crushing of bone ends because it has a resilient compressive structure. It's a great cushion. Then we have the joint cavity. That's just a space. The space is fluid filled. So synovial fluid we'll look at in a minute. And that's what the space is going to be filled with. The articular or joint capsule covers the space, the joint cavity. The inner layer is synovial, the outer layer fibrous. The inner layer makes synovial fluid, whereas the outer layer is dense irregular connective tissue, similar to the periosteum of both cartilage and bone. Synovial fluid is a fluid. It's thick, it's slippery, it's there to prevent friction between bone ends. So it's really good at lubricating, but also has some nourishing capabilities to that articular cartilage. It even contains phagocytic cells, which are going to be able to remove microbes, or anything, like a, anything that's similar to a pathogen, remove cell debris. And then the reinforcing ligaments of are, are of three types, capsular, extracapsular, and intracapsular. And that's just based on location. Capsular are actually a part of the fibrous layer of the articular capsule, so that's just going to be near that or an extension of the articular capsule. Extracapsular are outside the capsule, and intracapsular are deep to the capsule, generally covered by the synovial membrane of the artic articular capsule. You have nerves and blood vessels, so that means that at joints you can detect pain, monitor joint position, and stretch, and then capillary beds are going to supply the filtrate for the synovial fluid. Capillary beds also means that joints are generally vascularized, but oftentimes, depending on the position they're in, you may get less or more blood flow to that area. So here's that structure of a synovial joint. Again, the space is the joint cavity filled with synovial fluid. Around the space, you have the articular capsule with the inner synovial membrane, outer fibrous layer. And then making up the rest of the space would be the articular cartilage at the ends of long bones. And you oftentimes see that the articular capsule is going to be continuous with the periosteum of bone. And that ligaments are going to surround the capsule itself. Not pictured are the nerves and blood vessels. Here's just another view where we can see an actual synovial joint in a cadaver. So a little less impressive in the actual cadaver, but we can see the joint cavity very well. Some other friction reducing structures are a bursae and a tendon sheath. So a tendon sheath is an elongated version of a bursae, but they both are there to decrease friction between structures that may rub together, things like ligaments, muscles, skin against tendons, or bones. So bursae are more flattened, they're more sac-like, we can see some around the shoulder, but they are filled with synovial fluid, just like a tendon sheath. The tendon sheath, again, is an elongated bursa, and it wraps completely around a tendon. So if you think of a hot dog, the tendon sheath would be the bun, and the tendon would be the hot dog. So here, let's look at a structure. So under the acromion, we actually have a bursa. So this is the subacromial bursa. Then there's a tendon sheath that's wrapping around a tendon in a similar area. And again, the tendon is kind of like the hot dog if the tendon sheath is the bun. Both are fluid filled with synovial fluid. And again, they are friction reducing structures. All right, our next topic is going to be factors that influence the, the stability of synovial joints. So make sure that you review both the structural and functional classifications of joints. Look again at the terms synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diarthrotic as functional classifications and then see how those apply and factor into the structural classifications of fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial joints. So make sure to review that before watching this next video.